All right, then. It's time to talk about the Pocono 400 and, well, the tricky triangle, more than living up to its name. And I've just watched through it. Um, I'll start off with my own kind of reflections on the race itself. It was all right. There was a lot of things that would be quite expected through Pocono. It was a bit of a wreck fest at the end. So many different cautions. The race itself ending under caution. But, yeah, overall, yeah, it was an enjoyable watch. It was longer, but had more in terms of proportion entertainment than, say, the Hungarian Grand Prix. But, yeah, just... I think it's one of those ones where when you look at how many Cup Series races there are over a calendar, for myself, so European, it's like, is it really worth having this quantity of events? Quantity of venues, yes. Variety of venues, yes. But the amount of repeats that we have and the fact that it's pretty much every week, apart from a bye week. It's... Yeah. It's a bit much. That said, looking at the stats of this race, I mean, you would have thought, with the way the race had gone, with all the ebbs and flows, that you would see five of the top six being Toyotas. The top three being Toyotas. Hamlin, uh, then Reddick was given second at the end, and so it was 20... It was the 11, then it was the 23 11, and then it was Truex. Then it was the 4 of Harvick in 4th. I'm just trying to think, did he um, also end up... Yeah, he ended up with the 4th place finish in New Hampshire, didn't he? Uh, he's been doing really well in his farewell season, Harvick. Still winless, but... Yeah, and Ty Gibbs, 5th. I was quietly quite impressed with how much he's been climbing up the order and how he's been forming better and better over the course of the season. He's made really good progress. And he started to demonstrate a bit more maturity as well, which is another thing that we were all thinking Gibbs needs to work on before the season started. And then Bell in sixth. And, well, Bell and Reddick you could probably talk about with some of the incidents they had. Um, Logano, Larson, and of course Hamlin with Byron. It was... Oh, I, I even forgot to mention Austin Dillon there, but... Some of these incidents were just part of what makes Pocono Pocono, right? With the tricky triangle with the tunnel corner and how dangerous this track can be, as we know for when IndyCar was there. Having the air stolen off for you is such a big deal. And these Gen 7s are a lot more receptive to it than the Gen 6s on top of that. To say the Byron incident, for example, there wasn't any contact, but Hamlin got close enough to steal the air off of Byron. Was it Byron? No, sorry, it was Bowman, wasn't it? <laughs> um, and turned him around. And... It's... Yeah, that's just the way it goes when these cars are a lot more aerodynamic now. Let's think about the rest of the top 10. Sten asks some good points on the board. Burton some good points on the board. Running the top 10 for quite a while. Eric Jones as well, the 43. And Chase Elliott. It's what he needs to do, but he needs to be higher up at this point. He really does. Some drivers for a race to forget. Obviously, Daniel Suarez. Um, that's really harmed him in terms of the playoff picture. Um, yeah, I guess I'd say the same for Dylan. Um, another kind of race to forget. And there were some drivers who just weren't really there. Kyle Busch didn't really see him much, apart from when he was changing up his strategy. Blaney as well dropped way down the order. It was contact with the wall, wasn't there? And whilst uh, he dropped off to 20th at the end, Larson was running quite well, especially in terms of recovery from that crash. And when you look at some of the crashes, especially the Dylan one, it tells you how much NASCAR's taken the safety concern seriously after the basically kind of ending of Kurt Busch's career here at Pocono 12 months ago. Because that was a violent wreck that we saw. We saw a wreck almost with uh, Bowman, quite similar to what we saw with Busch. You have to remember, Bowman also had concussions from last season, ended up missing the tail end of the season. It was good to see that the drivers were able to walk away from these and that they're seemingly unharmed from what 12 months ago into the driver's career. 
But let's bring it across to the playoff picture. And now the cut line is between McDowell and Ormendinger. A good performance from Bubba Wallace to put him on 2,000 points exactly. I think it's... Um, and... Yeah, that... Well, no, I'm thinking that in terms of the playoffs. My bad. Because um, no stage wins, no stage points. That's the projected playoff picture I'm looking at. But no. 27 points above the cut line. Now 17 to Ormendinger right now. And then... Yeah, it's looking better and better for that 23 car. We could easily see four Toyotas. We could potentially even see all five. Sorry, not four, sorry, five or if not all six make it in, which would be a big deal. But right now we've got a couple more races left until the playoffs fully get underway. Richmond, Michigan. Brickyard, the Glen, and Daytona. So all of these drivers who have not got wins on the board yet, Harvick, Slowski, Busher, Wallace, and McDowell, if we have a different winner each of these races, there's somebody's playoff eligible. I mean, we could feasibly see 16 in the regular season. Those are my thoughts. I'm going to in the comment section down below. Thank you so much for watching. I hope to see you again soon. Bye for now.